Everyone, nice to see you. Um, thank you for taking time out of your very busy days and schedules to uh, hear more about our joint program. So I'm just going to kick it off. Our um, esteemed leader of Ariadne Labs, Dr. Asaf Bihan, is on his way over. We had an advisory board meeting this morning, so he's about four minutes away. Um, so he's going to join. He can impart his wisdom also. But I wanted to get started so we have enough time for questions. But the overall presentation isn't more than 20 minutes or something like that. So Ariadne Labs is a joint center that sits between the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Brigham and Women's Hospital. It was established back in 2012, and it was the intention uh, or Atul Gwandi's initial thought was that this would serve as a bridge between Harvard and the hospital. Mm -hmm. What we've been working on since Dean Daly came on board as, uh, as the HMS Dean is to, is to foster closer, closer collaboration with Harvard Medical School since much of what we do really has direct overlap in, in some of our programs like primary care. So we agreed uh, with Dean Daly's office just last year that we would expand our Tough more, tough <laughs> <laughs> um, Expand our uh, Spark Grants program, which was modeled after the Broad Institute program, which some of you may know, which is really internal grants that are uh, given out to faculty who are part of a network that Ariadne calls this community, it's extended community. There's an application for associate and affiliate faculty, which Grace will speak more about. I didn't introduce myself, I'm sorry. My name is Kathy Green, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Ariadne Lab. I, like Jen Puchetti, I'm a longtime Harvard person and have uh, moved around the university and came to Ariadne Labs about four and a half years ago. And uh, the idea that Atul had was like, let's try to grow. So by growing, uh, when I came on board, we were about 50 people now, we're 107, I think as of this week, and our uh, total budget is about $26 million, and that's primarily made up of grants and contracts and then philanthropy, and that's equally split between the Harvard side and um, the Brigham and Women's side and some, some GH. So the idea of the Spark Grants is, which Grace will talk about more, uh, is really to sort of foster this closer collaboration. But it's not like some internal grant programs, which many of you may see, which is just like you give out the money and see you later, hope it all goes well. There's a very, having been around Harvard for a long time, I can say this one really differs from other internal grant programs in the sense that there's uh, a real connection and that's sort of you know intended and deliberate to walk people through the process of uh, design and testing and spreading what are otherwise maybe high risk, sort of new, uh, maybe hard to fund ideas uh, to give clinicians, providers, researchers an opportunity to find fixes for the healthcare system as it stands today. So we don't really do diagnostics and we don't do drugs. What we're trying to test is, is there an idea that you have that is intended to fix a problem in the existing medical healthcare system today? So some of our solutions, some of you may know, Things like the safe surgery checklist. Um, there's a analog, which is the uh, the better birth checklist. But we also have we have digital tools we're developing to improve patient safety and quality across a wide range of fields. And uh, we have sort of four main core programs. So I think you probably have a slide on. But I think I just want to give you the sort of big picture overview. As we talk, you guys feel free, please, to like say I don't understand. Can you stop on that? I have a question. We can also take questions after, but I want I don't want people to get stuck when we talk our own language and then you guys don't know what we're talking about. So please feel free to interrupt and interject along the way. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so I'm Grace Galvin. I'm our assistant director of uh, Innovation Platform, which I'll talk more about. And I, like Kathy, am a, I guess I've been at Harvard my whole working life, so you can decide how long you think that is. <laughs> Um, as Kathy said, um, our mission is to design, test, and spread simple solutions that improve care um, at critical moments in people's lives. We've expanded that critical moment thing to include primary care, um, but I don't actually have a slide on it, so I'll just say that the areas that we work in or have worked in to date are surgery, um, serious illness, childbirth, both, both high income and low and middle income settings, um, and primary care. We also have initiatives that are outside of those four. Um, looking at, as Kathy said, digital solutions for improving uptake um, of, of the use of up-to-date, um, the app, and uh, digital phenotyping in, in the space of surgery recovery. So a lot of different solutions. But um, also, as Kathy mentioned, um, <coughs> our mission is design, test, and spread. That's sort of our, our overarching framework, but it's also a methodology that we have. Um, our um, 
want to point, but I can't point. Um, the innovation platform, so that's my, um, my functional area, um, provides a certain level of expertise in our design space, and this, the next slide details that a little bit more. Our science and technology platform really shines in the test phase, bringing rigorous methods to um, designing for behavior change and outcomes, and then a light test change to get you to that next phase, which is the spread, um, the spread phase, which is sort of ongoing. Our, our unofficial motto is every patient everywhere, every time. So the work is sort of ongoing um, or never ending. And the implementation platform really brings um, coaching, training, and expertise both in theory and boots on the ground to actually deliver the, the interventions. So I said innovation platform um, and what we offer, um, strategic guidance, an issue focus, a real focus on human-centered design methods, and delivering those um, to improve whatever idea you came in with, the actual um, design of a solution, and um, stakeholder management is also a really key piece of that throughout the entire arc, but starting in that early stage. I also mentioned the science and technology uh, platform here. They have what they call verticals in data, computer, and improvement science and then the implementation team who brings the readiness assessment, and again, those, those individuals who have expertise in coaching um, and implementation. Um, what is a Spark Grant? I'll let you all waiting for. So it's, an, as we say, sort of an internal funding mechanism, um, usually $100,000 for one year of direct cost. Uh, we want to go for those ideas that wouldn't necessarily be funded through a traditional mechanism. Um, we want your crazy ideas, and, and we want them to be feasible, but we also want you to, to go big or go home. Um, as we mentioned, too, they'd be advised by the innovation platform and integrated into our matrix approach. Um, so you'll see in the RFP, there's a mention of working with the innovation platform. Um, <coughs> Hi, Asaf, welcome. <laughs> uh, talking about the innovation platform and Spark Grants. So feel free to jump in whenever you'd like to. Well, I'll just say, <laughs> I wasn't picking up on your hint. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the executive director of Ariadne, and I'm 15 minutes late because our semi-annual board meetings happened and went late, so I apologize about that. And I get to work with Kathy and, and, Chris and many other people. Um, I'll finish this. And, I mean, you can, if you want to talk about some of our current yeah. past projects. Okay. Um, so integrated into our matrix, as you'll see on the RFP, we make mention of working with the innovation platform to determine what resources are needed to get the project done. Those may be resources that you would include um, on your side, but also ones that Ariadne Labs can provide um, for you. The ones on the previous slide across the platform, but also like research assistant time or project manager time, if that's useful. Um, it's a one-year grant with a possibility of renewal. Maximum total is two years. Hit all this. Right. Yeah. So this one's like yeah. matrix, and then I think sometimes it's helpful mm -hmm. to see the title okay. in the next one. Again, we don't usually work uh, so on the fly like today, but um, <laughs> a board meeting with all those things, as you know, are a little complicated. Um, I know many of you, by the way, I see good friends like Russ Phillips and, and Margaret and many other. Um, uh, uh, people that I've, um, I'm a primary care physician by both training and current practice, um, health policy researcher, and um, I'll, before we talk about the current SPARC project, maybe it would be helpful to just, actually you know what we'll do is we'll talk about these projects and then I just want to kind of um, put the, situate this a little bit in uh, a theory of how we work and, and our hope working with this with the Dean's Spark Grant money to think about how we could work together in, in a, with broader communities like your own. So um, some of the projects that we um, build, and we think about these as, as an innovation pipeline, um, we have our four big areas of work, which I'll kind of come back to talking about, and I'm sure Grace and Kathy mentioned. These areas represent both a way into becoming a, a, for a large area of our focus, as well as um, a way for the communities. Um, we have 154 faculty from around the Harvard and hospital and non-healthcare community that intercalate with us on a regular basis as a part of our mission to design, build, test, and spread 
things that make a difference to reduce suffering in people's lives, both globally and locally. And so some of the past projects that have um, been funded and have gotten some really interesting traction and results include things like Better Evidence, which is actually with a faculty member of yours, um, who uh, Rebecca Weintraub, who has led the Global Health Delivery Project, has worked with GHSM for many years. So Better Evidence is the idea, and maybe it's okay, Jean. Um, uh, maybe uh, some of you have worked with Rebecca and her team on this. Um, a number of years ago, as part of the Global Health Delivery online platform, um, she and her team realized that one of the things that clinicians in lower resource settings needed the most was a, an ability to have access to content on the latest and, and uh, most up-to-date literature on how to treat, how to diagnose and treat complex or not complex clinical conditions um, in, in formats that also were tuned to those resource environments. For many years, GHC hosted, and maybe some of you participated, in a platform, a uh, sort of moderated discussion, where uh, clinicians from all over the world could ask questions, and clinicians from other parts of the world could help in answering those questions. And that was a, a start to kind of um, bridge that gap. Another thing that then came to be, and, and we ended up funding, was um, an outreach to uh, UpToDate, which is an online resource tool on up-to-date clinical knowledge. They're located in Waltham. They were started by clinicians in and around the Harvard system. And basically, the team, um, before they came to Ariadne and then we funded further work within Ariadne, said, could we create a scaling mechanism to distribute free licenses of this platform <coughs> to clinicians in low resource settings? And what would happen if that if that were the case, and, and what they've done successively, starting in the hundreds and the thousands, and most recently it's about 22,000 licensed distributions a year to clinicians in like 60 countries, is really see that the same sort of improvements are happening in terms of better clinical decision making with having access to these decision tools, and also some interesting things that we weren't necessarily, we didn't know what happened or starting to happen. So as part of this distribution mechanism, they kind of built in a renewal mechanism to ask clinicians um, to, in return for getting license, free licenses to this resource, to respond to an annual survey in a renewable fashion, so such that um, you have basically now a global cohort survey of now 22,000 clinicians on the front lines all over the world. And you can use that as an interesting academic platform. You can also use it to understand how people are using these tools to advance their clinical care. And the first thing that emerges is all sorts of incredible stories. Um, last month, a um, physician from southern Uganda wrote in on his annual license renewal telling us about a case uh, where a patient came in with fever and some nose bleeding and some rash, and he used his up-to-date license, and it, it suggested that given his confluence of symptoms that um, he should suspect not only the usual hemorrhagic fevers, but also Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, called the local Ministry of Health um, uh, area or district level. They um, moved it up to national level. Long story short, the um, patient was tested and actually had Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. It became the index case, but because, and this is his writing, not ours, because of the fact that he had access to this clinical tool and access to his local ministry health resources, they believed that they identified the index case and actually contained um, a, a small epidemic in that area. That's really interesting. Rebecca and her team have also documented and published on the fact that they had enough licenses, and those licenses are tied to IP addresses, which are tied to geolocated um, uh, spots that they were able to look at the metadata and they asked and they requested and were received from up to date the metadata um, for all of West Africa in 2014 and found that in fact about as almost 100 days before any official mention in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia of Ebola happened that they're seeing um, statistically significant increases in searches for hemorrhage and fever, hemorrhage rash and fever, eye bleeding fever, um, and then 40 days before any searches, there were actually searches in the right locations, the right parts of Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, um, uh, searches for Ebola. Um, so clinicians on the ground knew that they were dealing, or they had a suspicion or a concern that they were dealing, and I respect and know that some of you in the room were there soon thereafter or during, 
Um, and so this is not going to come as a surprise, but what I'm trying to articulate is the potential for a tool that's now in some scalable use to become a pandemic surveillance tool or a pandemic monitoring tool. Um, interestingly, the spikes go up for searches for Ebola and Ebola-related symptoms in those areas. Um, Google, we had access to some Google metadata. There were no sort of um, commensurate spikes <coughs> earlier before um, the, the spikes in our data. Just suggesting that there is a there is a benefit to um, understanding clinician perceptions and searches for diagnostics for differential diagnoses. So better evidence is now kind of rolling out its number of licenses and <coughs> rolling out to different um, digital online tools like. Uh, we're hoping to have another couple, um, and also rolling out the use of a platform where you have a cohort that you can follow longitudinally that um, discusses how they use um, digital diagnostic tools and what the barriers are to their use. Other tools that, um, other programs that we funded, um, uh, I'll talk about Rural Hospital at Home, a faculty member at the Brigham named David Levine. Um, is a primary care doc and a home hospitalist. He created the Brigham Home Hospital Program, which those of you who interact with hospital medicine know is a thing that's increasing about a quarter of inpatient admissions uh, for medical um, conditions. Uh, so those would be like deep vein thrombosis, pneumonia, CHF exacerbations, et cetera, can be sought to be safely be triaged instead of from the ER to inpatient rooms, they can be triaged from ER home. And he, he and his team have built a program that allows the safe management of those patients, and they followed it with successive smaller and now larger tests culminating in a randomized controlled trial that was published last month um, on the experience of the Brigham compared to a cohort of control patients. It showed that um, safety outcomes uh, were the same across both inpatients and home hospital patients. Um, patient experiences with their care were much improved being at home being with your loved ones or your pets or with food and without sensors that are beeping all the time is an obviously better experience and cost was about 40% less. You get same outcomes for lower cost, better patient experience. It's a rarely heard of triumvirate of the triple aim that everyone loves to talk about but is rarely seen in, in reality. And so um, what David is doing is not just expanding that when the radius um, uh, is, let's say, five miles from the ER to a patient's potential home, and it's a twice-a-day nurse visit, home, um, wearable sensors, and an, uh, a physician visit, they're asking a different related question, which is what would it take to expand a home hospital offering to rural and super-rural areas in the U.S., knowing that there is a critical access issue amongst hospitals in rural areas that have average daily senses of one to two patients. There are workforce shortages, and those of you who've worked in rural um, settings know all, all the multiplicity of challenges. But the answer isn't just to take the Brigham Urban Program and put it into a rural setting. It's actually to rethink it, because there's a critical workforce shortage. There actually aren't nursing um, capacities or availability of workforce in most rural areas, but there is one that is available, and that's paramedics. And so there's a cross-training of paramedics who actually are licensed in most to be able to offer um, and, and do things like infusions and venipuncture and things like that. And so they're building in two locations, one in the northeast corner of Utah, in Vernal, Utah, um, and one uh, with the Blackfoot um, uh, Indian Nation in northern Montana, a rural home, home hospital um, offering. We're enrolling some of the first few patients this year, and we'll Take it step by step. Really, it's, think of this as phase one, safety, feasibility. Can this be done? Should it be done? It's a participatory process uh, with both communities. Do they want this? What is the impact on hospital use? What is the impact? It's being co-built with um, the tribal nation in northern Montana. So that's a sort of exciting spark that started as an idea to build the safety and the sensors and the workforce in one area. Enough of a proof of concept got to the second year, second area, and now is being expanded to actually enroll patients. And in both cases, they were able to attract external funding yes. in addition to something. Right. Thank you, Kathy. So, you know, you start with an idea, and if it shows proof points, as Grace talked to you about, if you work it through a process with pro project and product management, if you work it through a process with statistical or other tech support, and again, we don't 
um, ever say that we have the pathway to healthcare innovation and delivery redesign. We just have a useful <coughs> set of tools and, and ideas that have worked for a number of projects before, and the goal of these offerings and this um, collaboration between HMS and Ariadne is really to, to really widen a community of potential innovators um, to participate in these offerings and see if, if there are successful um, or, you know, we're also totally fine with failure. We're not being, a, you know, we really believe that good ideas should be tried. You should have a pathway to understanding if they work and if they don't work. Some of these, many of these have, have retired and that's okay. Um, the goal isn't self-replication and perpetuation of funding. The goal is impact. Um, the goal is the idea of opening an, uh, an aperture or a window on a new idea or a new conversation <coughs> with the explicit goal not to sort of describe a landscape of problems or just to write a paper, but really to, to take a, 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 an idea to an intervention that wouldn't otherwise be easily funded with usual mechanisms, NIH and global funders, et cetera. Um, it might... Help. Uh, I could go on and on, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for some of the possibilities. I, I know that Grace talked about, you know, this is this is our human-centered design process. There's a lot under it that's kind of conceptualized here. But again, just to review what we are as an organization, we were founded basically with the idea that there are, as you know, as you study, as you work on in your settings, in your environments, in your work, there are so many examples of human suffering caused by the gap between what we know as a medicine and public health community can and probably should be done about a given area and what is actually done. This no-do gap has many reasons and it's not a blame, it's not a shame, it's just a gap that causes quantifiable human suffering. And when you think about that gap and you say, what are areas and tools that can be tested, we often in academia have suffered from the, the describe it ad infinitum, but don't try it enough or don't try it in a process that would be designed to actually be able to hit an endpoint. And then even if you could hit an endpoint, scaling that to multiple locations. Now, that's less the case, I think, with your department, but it is the case with many parts of academia that the production model, the, not, the, the, the whole production of knowledge is often enough and um, and that is to be respected by us, but we really want to drive um, the reduction of measured suffering in areas that our community of faculty know something about and those started in the surgical landscape, they moved to childbirth and they went to primary care and to serious illness. And so we have those big, four big areas of focus, both globally and locally, about four. 40% of our work is U.S. based, about 60% of our work is globally based. Did you guys go through many of the programs <coughs> in any detail? Just sort of um, at name. Yeah, I mean, I would just point to sort of two that have most relevance in which I used to run the primary health care team before I, I moved into this position. So the two teams that have the most global work, um, in case that might be of interest as thinking about projects that <coughs> in, intercalate with your work, um, the primary health care team works principally with an initiative called the Primary Health Care Performance Initiative, um, funded by Gates, inclusive of WHO, now UNICEF, um, World Bank, and others. And it's really a partnership meant to both reimagine and converge on a set of workable definitions of primary health care metrics related to those definitions, and then ways of of displaying four key stakeholders, patients, communities, policymakers, ministers of finance, health, et cetera, what the condition of a primary health care system is in low and middle income countries. Um, as you can imagine with that complex partnership, it's taken years to get to working definitions and measures, but they're there. And those have been translated into what are called vital signs profiles. Those are at, at a minimum one page that you can put in front of a parliamentary committee on health or the Minister of Finance or the Minister of Health. And so this is a condition in a consensus-based way, a co-produced way with the country of your primary health care system. Here's the gaps in both um, financing, governance, um, inputs, orientation to um, innovation, uh, attunement to population needs, empanelment, service delivery metrics, and the core functions of clinical primary care and others. And this is an agreed upon definition that has endorsement by 
if it matters to you, some international bodies, but more importantly, has had now use in 15 countries. It was rolled out in the 2018 Global Primary Healthcare Conference at Astana. Maybe some of you were there, or maybe you heard about it. I don't know that any conference is all that useful, but it was a starting place for getting this work out, and now it's been um, moved to 60 countries. And this measurement scheme linked to evidence-informed improvement strategies linked to both domestic and global resource mobilization pathways is one of the pathways that were endorsed on the side sessions of the UN General Assembly with the Universal Health Coverage um, Resolution last fall. So it's a thing. Um, measurement schemes sometimes are helpful. What's really helpful are partnerships between governments or um, this or sub-regional units that um, want to get serious about both naming gaps in performance or attunement of primary health care systems to outcomes, and then co-partnering on the production of um, new strategies forward. And we have some wonderful ongoing examples of deep country partnership in Costa Rica. I, a few years ago, I gave a talk about uh, our work in partnership with Costa Rica. We work a lot with Ghana um, and uh, Senegal and, and a few states in India. But just to let you know, that's happening. We've done a lot of new measurement work. We did two of the first um, national patient experience and patient reported outcomes surveys um, at a national level, uh, one, two in Ghana in successive years and one in Uganda. So those are things that the team does. Um, the Better Birth team has been really focused on trying to um, reduce maternal mortality, like a lot of people around the world and around Harvard. Um, Initially, through the creation and rollout of the Safe Childbirth Checklist um, uh, in different parts of the world, especially in India, first in southern India, and then culminating in a large randomized trial in Uttar Pradesh. The randomized trial of the Safe Childbirth Checklist didn't meet its primary endpoint of reducing maternal mortality. There are lots of reasons why it didn't. You could talk about them if you want. Um, but there's a lot of work that's come after that, especially on trying to understand, and this may be of interest to you, um, uh, new, and new ways of thinking about readiness of frontline facilities and frontline workforce and frontline managers to, um, to change, to be ready to implement not just checklists, but any improvement initiative, whether the right finance and um, structural capacities and training capacities are there. And so the work continues both with um, attunement to more ready frontline facilities, perhaps than more NUP. This was a trial about 200 facilities, 165,000 births. Um, so in, now we're shifting the work to, to other environments, both in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and also working um, right now on a, a second body of work around um, uh, trying to measure and, and, and find better um, feeding strategies for low-growth weight infants. So we're trying to find those um, that, that subgroup of infants that is highest at risk for U5 mortality and um, figure out if there are new and better ways to feed and care for them. So that's some of the work that's going on. Um, we saw um, in this setting some of the SPAR projects. To be very clear, none of the none of the proposed SPAR projects need to have anything to do with our existing work. We, um, some of our work um, that we end up supporting through the organization ends up being totally new coming up through the pipeline. So I just want to give you a sense of the kinds of work locally and globally that we do. We're really interested in impact, um, measuring impact in interventions and in trying interventions, um, and then understanding which work and which don't and why. Um, so, uh, you know, the one thing I would just say is, uh, you know, be, that would be the most helpful frame. Um, again, the goal of, of the dean's support of this project, process and project is to merge our processes around early stage testing with um, a, an outreach, and most of the money would go really to, to you, your faculty, your staff, to do the work and do it with defined milestones and endpoints and see if, if you can get it to the next level of testing. Um, again, these are some of, the, some of the things. We do a lot of work at Ariadne really around communication and teamwork. Um, I would say if there's one thread, speaking of the metaphor of threads, I'm sure you talked about spiders and Minotaurs and labyrinths. If you didn't, that's what <laughs> Atul Gawande founded the place. He's a writer. He loves metaphors. And so Ariadne was the Greek goddess who um, helped uh, Theseus 
if you needed help, get out of the, um, the labyrinth. The labyrinth is a metaphor for healthcare systems that aren't responsive to people's needs and cost way too much to provide too little. Um, the simple, the threads that, like the ball of string that Ariadne gave to Theseus to get out, find his way out of the labyrinth, are like our proposed platonic ideal of the best ideas that are simple and convergent and useful. So it's a lot to explain. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, the, that's the whole story, and you can see our insignia. It's the labyrinth. Um, but so, many, so much of our work actually is really around communication, and I and I think of it as um, if you look at what is a checklist, the checklist not, is not just a bunch of stuff to put on a wall to do before an operating room, uh, a surgery in an operating room or before a childbirth. It's really an opportunity to take a pause point to identify the members of the team, inclusive of the patient and her family, who participate in that person's care, to have a conversation that anticipates and hopes to mitigate some possible bad outcomes that could arise in this critical moment in a person's life, whether that moment in surgery right before giving birth or a moment in an office setting or in a virtual setting, about that's an opportunity to have a conversation about the person's highest goals, wishes, values, and fears as they enter um, the next stages of their life in encountering serious illness. And actually, the primary care offerings are also a communication tool. They're just a different way of making explicit what had been heretofore implicit and totally accepted gaps of financing, care, attunement to population needs, attunement to family, and, and co-produced healthcare systems. And so the, these tools that we build when they work are often communication tools to really make evident choices that are buried into a system and then to try to mitigate some of the likely bad outcomes that happen around the lack of a system or a process that's designed to ensure safety <clears throat> and a better outcome. So after the ICU is a, is a, is a, a, a pilot around building a, a conversation process and actually a clinic to um, see patients if, after an ICU setting because post-traumatic ICU disorder or stress disorder is, is a, such a prevalent thing for people with extended ICU stays, and there, there was a, a, a suggestion that naming that and, and using trauma-informed care principles to help people communicate about the trauma that they suffer in an ICU setting would be helpful. We talked about the rural home hospital. We've thought about um, there is already here um, a genomic revolution in information that is not really reaching primary care, it's certainly reaching specialty care, it's reaching cancer care, but um, a lot of information has been gathered around genetics that hasn't found a way into usable systems in primary care. So there's a team investigating that, there's a team investigating how to better screen for, talk about, and intervene on stress and stress-related um, conditions and their interactions with other um, uh, with other illnesses in the primary care and behavioral health setting and, and uh, a similar way of um, promoting better communication and earlier intervention for kids um, who have uh, 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 or conditions that are amenable to early intervention in the pediatric setting and really frameworks for talking about that and building them systemically. So that's uh, called better partnerships. So those are recent um, titles, and then um, how do we make decisions? And this will be a new um, set of decisions for us as we are now um, working with the dean's office and your departments to make a set of decisions on these grants. So just to name the fact that though I think we haven't formalized it, we'll have some sort of kind of um, subcommittee that will include members of, of HMS departments um, to help us make the decision. It won't just be some closed door thing at Ariadne. But these are the areas, um, we'll share these slides with you, that, that we've looked for in the past to kind of figure out what are the highest potential product projects. And again, just because they're not chosen doesn't, it's not really a statement of in, um, value, it's really a statement of alignment with the process that we can help catalyze. So I just want to say that we're not like an NIH subcommittee that pretends to put value on, on ideas. Um, so clarity, um, uh, I would say the biggest one is, is there really a route to impact um, on a population level? And it doesn't mean that the initial very modest 
um, suffusion of funds would actually, we, we don't think that you'll be able to show movement on a, on a um, clinical or social outcome, but is there, can you draw out a set of steps by which you might know, okay, maybe in one year uh, I might have a workable, um, you know, prototype, and if that prototype shows some early, early process changes in the beginning of the second year, then maybe in the third year you can see if you could build a reasonable and, and safe and aligned test of it somewhere with partnership. Feasibility is a huge thing. They're great ideas that $100,000 are not going to really bring to fruition, and so if it's an amazing idea, but it's not a got, it's not got a, a very clear, feasible set of um, milestones that it could attain to see if it might have legs, the, you know, toward its end race of success, then that's a big thing. And then, is there the leadership on the team, and it, we really see these as team-based projects too, and the and the multiplicity <coughs> of skills that might be needed, and to which we could we could complement at Ariadne to see it um, come to fruition. Um, here's the process timeline. Um, the uh, letters of intent are now open, and um, one of the reasons we're going around HMS. Oh. Go ahead, keep going. Oh, I'll just add when you're done. Oh. I, I always defer to you. Oh, no, I'm happy for you. No, no. Okay. <laughs> um, so I what I get out of <laughs> where she's much. Well, um, what I wanted to say is um, on our website, there's a link to the RFP, which has all of these key dates in much more legible font. So the LOIs are due to us um, on March 2nd. I just wanted to highlight that. It's a one to two page uh, description of your idea um, with fields that sort of mirror the criteria that we'll be selecting on. Um, we're happy to have one page. We just wanted to allow two pages, um, but wanted to keep it to a minimum. Uh, the committee reviews and then will invite for full application, um, and those applications will be due in mid-April. So, if you wouldn't mind us off the next slide, it's profound. Um, so, you can reach me at the Spark Grants at AriadneLabs.org email address, any questions, um, and also as a way to submit your LOI. If you go to the Ariadne Labs um, website at backslash Spark hyphen Grants. Uh, you can access the RFP um, as well as an LOI template and a budget um, template as well. Just to note, we're not asking for a budget with the LOI, but just for you to come up with a number as a space to play and come up with a number. And if you want to have a conversation about how much does Ariadne Labs resources cost or how much do they cost, um, I can help with um, those estimates and just have a more uh, in-depth discussion about what we provide. So. With that, if, if you want any last words, Asaf or Kathy, we're happy to take questions from you all. Uh, just curious, are we gonna? Is there any way to have access to a slide where you wrote um, the criteria that you that you review? Sure, we'd be happy to send these around um, in a PDF or something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another. It's also in the RFP. It's in the RFP. Yeah, okay. on the website. Um, if you click on that. You just mentioned in terms of what Ariadne can provide or and the cost associated. Can you elaborate just a little bit on that in terms of Sure. Um, can I grab that? So um, across our platforms, we have various team members that can provide any of the things on the slide. Um, uh, in the past, we've estimated 5% of an innovation specialist. 5% of someone on science and technology to help think through methods, and 5% of someone on implementation to help connect with the training, coaching, um, and implementation needs. So I could give you the figures that go behind the 5%, or if you have a very specific idea, we could talk a little bit more about what would it be for somebody on a qualitative, um, for a qualitative spe specialist or something more specific. Uh, we also have research assistants and project managers that can help to get the work done, sort of more day-to-day -day people who would be doing the work. Um, but of course, you have those staff members too that you know we can work with that. Does that help? Okay. So, in, in the proposals, is there like specific geographical areas in the world? Because mostly you mentioned, um, I think, in correct me if I'm in Africa, but is there like in the <coughs> or in China or other? <laughs> Sorry, it was a little hard to 
we have current projects there or are we interested in projects or there? Both. Um, do you want to take the current? Because I'm not yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, I mean, we have work right now in 26 countries, um, but none of what you propose has to mm -hmm. be on top of that or in those countries. It's really wide open. I mean, I think the idea here is, and again, just to reiterate, this came from the dean, and the dean's idea is can can we match um, what we can bring in a human-centered design and process innovation lens? And it's not to say that you don't do that, but it's just can you bring the, match those resources to your early stage ideas? And what's interesting is that we haven't, to my knowledge, have we had a spark outside the U.S.? So we haven't had except for the better evidence. The better <laughs> evidence but was the, the, besides the better evidence, parts, most of our <coughs> grants have been U.S. based, and we're hoping that that changes. So, but we're also cognizant that it's not a ton of money. So, so that's the reality. Um, with that arc of innovate and then test and then implement. I wasn't exactly clear. Could the Spark grant be anywhere across that arc? Are you only looking at people going from innovation to test or app test? Or how does this graphic interface with the Spark grant itself? Yeah, I think we're open to, to anything. I think oftentimes it's a way to um, start at the beginning of the arc that's often not traditionally um, mm -hmm. funded through other mechanisms. Um, but certainly the um, translation of the um, home care to a rural setting was a little it wasn't, you know, traditional to start from an idea and go to design, um, test uh, the after the ICU project that Asaf mentioned also was, um, they had already come up with the clinic idea and actually testing it at the Brigham was something that, that we supported. Um, spread, I'm not sure I can think of one off the top of my head, but certainly we're open we're to totally it. Open. So yeah. it isn't intended to no. be. It doesn't have to just be This here. is more your philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think because the innovation platform specializes in design, Oftentimes things um, come out that way, but certainly test and spread are, are open. Okay, yeah. Um, so the, the, the folks that are eligible to apply is quad faculty, is it ladder faculty only or are research faculty also <coughs> eligible? Um, I think research faculty, but I've, the intention behind this was to have a fairly open um, process. And, and we will ask yeah, like okay. David Wong about this, but you know, it's not just quad faculty, but also Center for Primary Care um, faculty, as well as Department of Population Medicine faculty. Okay. We'll get in, we'll, we'll make sure to loop back around because I know how complicated it can be a differential name, but I, I know the intent, which was a broad okay. intent. Did I see one more back there? Yes, please. How many, how many, um, Invitations we send out for the two grants. Um, that's a good question. I think it also depends on how many LOIs we receive. Um, in the past, we've cut it by half for the next round, um, but that was sort of based on getting 12 to 16 um, LOIs. So, if I'm guessing, I could imagine we wouldn't say more than six. Six or seven. Six, but yeah. Is there a restriction on the number of airlines per group, a research group? Nope. So it might be up to your department maybe to make a decision about how you want to handle that, somebody in the group, just so that you can, if you want to be coordinated about it. Um, we should note, so there's a lot of, of course, the basic science departments in the quad are not necessarily, they're not doing sort of what we're doing. So this is really open to kind of uh, Division of Bioinformatics, uh, Global Health Social Medicine, Center for Primary Care, as Asaf mentioned, Department of Population Medicine, and healthcare policy. So it's not like it's everybody all of a sudden applying. So we expect that there'll be sort of fewer actual people. So should we think about this as a collaboration with Ariadne where we're looking at approximately $100,000 in grant money, but we're bringing you into the process to work with you as part of our team? So of that $100,000, um, you'll be written in for a portion of that. Yeah. Depending on the need. Yeah. Depending on the need. I mean, we haven't specified it needs to be X thousand. Um, but the intent of the overall process is to build a collaborative mechanism. So it's not just an intent to fund things that were already on your shelf that you wanted to fund. It's just a new process. It's, it's an in, 
And I think that the successful projects will be those that, in a short amount of time, if they don't, they, you know, you may not be able to sort of get to know your possible colleagues at Ariadne, but those, the successful projects might be ones that might be attuned to areas of obvious match and overlap and interest and, um, and, and crosstalk. Other thoughts. Um, this isn't the only opportunity. Also, uh, again, this is really the beginning of an invitation of hopeful collaboration. This is one mechanism. We thank the dean's office for it. We have um, again this community of uh, faculty. It's got a pretty. Um, uh, it, it works in two directions. We meet uh, approximately twice a month at our space. People give interesting talks. They're not the usual intro you know, methods, results, conclusions. They're really, this is what I'm trying to do, this is what I'm facing, this is implementation challenge, this is what I've learned. Um, the participation in the community, again, it's all voluntary, it's, um, but it's also bi-directional. It's been a format for getting people involved in the SPARC grants. Um, most community members, uh, we survey year over year, end up finding a way to collaborate. Um, about 40% have written grants together, either with our faculty or, or each other. Um, many papers have been published. This is a, an, another opportunity, if you're implementation minded, to just find people that have common interests. It's also got a global health focus, as I think you can tell from our work. So, you know, if this route of collaboration doesn't seem interesting or doesn't work out, there are other routes too, and the invitation is wide open. We all have a lot to learn from each other. So what do you anticipate as sort of the next step for a successful SPARC grant? Do you, like, are there examples of companies being formed or core grants or, um, you know, sort of what, recognizing that $100,000 doesn't go a long way? Exactly. Know, what, what, what and that's a, that's a really valid point. I think, you know, the, the two uh, examples that Fox gave just happened also had to have worked with us to find external funding. Uh, while they were doing the spark work, we were able to sort of help them write their proposals and get those up the drop for, for additional funding. And that's something that we work with Jen and their staff to figure to figure out. Um, the there's been talk about spin-offs, but the you know it depends on whether there's actual sort of a commercially viable product. I think on the other end, it's something that we are open to, but I don't think it's something that we have necessarily focused on exclusively. And this came up obviously at CDMI as well. Um, but I think we are hoping that. Some fail and some they sort of don't take off and flourish afterwards, and that's okay too. And we learn from those. But the ones that do succeed, they sort of continue on after the spark grant. The spark grant is just the seed that helps it get started. Yeah. But uh, I mean, as Kathy was saying, you know, the idea isn't to necessarily create some IP and, and a company. The, the idea is to create a, a pathway to successively test an idea that seems to continue to meet endpoints of inter intermediate endpoints of having traction with this community of users or being able to change a process or, or, or beginning to change an outcome. I mean, great work done, you know, a Spark-like mechanism that was before we called it Spark, really, that actually ended up becoming one of our programs, one of our four programs. And what it started off was a series of questions around why there is unwarranted variation in C-section rates across um, hospitals and ended up um, moving towards some really interesting findings um, around the design of hospitals, the design of labor and delivery, the physical design, working with architects to analyze that physical design. And I know there's been similar work across the design of hospitals at CCB and as in Rwanda I'm thinking about, and it's actually that same group of Mass College of Design, um, uh, building a hypothesis around um, uh, different uh, human, different physician and actually nurse factors beyond the design factors that may interplay, and then actually now building uh, a large, it's a four hospital intervention that just finished and it's going to more. So that's obviously the huge success case, but that's not the normative trend. I mean, if we can advance and test an idea a fair amount of the way, and a lot of the Spark Grant is really about what it would take to know that it's worth embarking on the next step and who might fund that next step. But we're pretty practical people, too. We I mean, just don't want everyone to do all this work and then it not be fundable. And, but we're not just chasing money or chasing funding. We're really chasing the impact of things that move the needle on suffering. 
So please, oh, I'm sorry, does it have to be something that you're studying or it can be something that you're implementing without a huge focus on collecting data? And the you is you or us? Well, the application, the project. Yeah. Say again. Does it, does it need to be something where you're proposing to do a study? Or can you be, be proposing to implement something where the focus really is on the implementation and not that necessarily on a amount of data collection? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. We love data in, in you know, monitoring evaluation yeah. and QI sort of mode as well. It yeah. doesn't have to be rigorous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you guys thank so you. much for your time. Please do email if there's anything uh, we can answer and hope to hear more about your ideas. <laughs> <laughs>